Welcome to Sister Power. I'm your host, Sharon Thomas Yarbrough. And we're excited today. We have two fabulous women here from Southern California. And we're going to speak about the impact of systemic racism and mental health in the black culture. Welcome, ladies. Aloha. 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 Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Very quickly, I know that July is uh, National Minority Mental Health Month. Am I correct on that? Yes, you are. All right. And so first, Dr. King, introduce yourself. Tell us a quick, give us a quick snapshot of what you do, who you are, and then Latanya will hear from you. Thank you so much for having me on the show today. I'm Dr. Akin Marino. I'm a psychologist. I am a behavior health commissioner and I'm a mental health solutionist. Basically, I try to find solutions to people's lives using mental health concepts. And I'm also a pastor. Oh, all right, pastor. Uh -huh. And I am Aloha, everyone. I am Latanya Washington. I am the founder of the International List Tour for leaders and entrepreneurs, also um, the customer culture. And as well as I am now an associate professor at MSJC, um, instructing in marketing and excited to be here. Uh, so happy to hear you. When I was listening to your show, Latanya, I was on Facebook and it your conversation struck me on the uh, information that Dr. King was giving us about the impact of systemic racism and mental health in the black culture. And I froze for a moment and she was saying that we're in a state of alert. And I want to check, I want to talk, speak further about that, Dr. King, and explain racial trauma and its impacts collectively and individually. Yeah, you know, thank you so much. The word trauma means wound. So when we're talking about trauma, we're talking about a wound. And when we're talking about racial trauma, we're talking about the experiences of a collective body that has been traumatized based on either systems of oppression or personal in, you know, personal interactions with race, racist, racist systems and racist, racist people. It, in, and as a black community, we have been impacted. It's a historic uh, trauma. So when we talk about slavery, the impact of slavery has not ended. It's still with us because we have, there's, a, there's a something called epigenetics. And epigenetics is, uh, it's the, when you think of your DNA, your DNA is basically, um, written in stones you can't change your dna it's there okay you, you, the dna you were born with is what you're going to die with but but there's something called the expression of your dna the way you the way you express your dna based on either um biological influence psychological influences environmental influences you know cultural influences some things will be will, will be influenced will influence the way that you actually react in life so let me give you an example. When they did the when they did a study on several studies on prisoners of war, you know, uh, people that have experienced just heinous crimes in the world, they found out um, circumstances in the world. They found out that the 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 consequences of the trauma that they experienced was not limited to their lives, and so they they might have you know an inability to to focus. You know, it might be alcoholism. It might be, you know, just been in a state of, of deprivation. And it didn't stop there. It went, continued in generations. And so the next generation also had the same symptoms and the generation after that. And so this thing carries on through generations. So we are still experiencing the, the, the trauma from slavery, not only the historic trauma, but the current trauma, the one that is being perpetrated right now with the, with the, with the culture that we have, when we talk about institutional racism, institutional um, uh, systemic racism. So not only are we dealing with historic trauma, we're also dealing with personal trauma. And so that means that we're constantly, like I said on the show, on a state of alert. Wow, that's deep. What, what was your take on that when you first 
um, interview Dr. King about the impact of systemic racism, LaTanya? You know what? She brought some knowledge to us that, you know, what you don't, we didn't even think about. And so I was like in shock. I was in shock because you recognize the fact that even as we go through life, we've always been told, you know, we have to stay two steps of, ahead, things that we have to do. And then we don't realize that we are consistently in a state of alert. We're always thinking about what do I need to do to stay ahead. And so when you begin to think about what she said, it made me say, okay, now I know, as we talked about, now I'm aware now, what is it that I need to do in order to push through and get to the next level? I like Ooh. that. Yeah, yeah. And that's it. it, it you, uh, you've heard from the time that you could read and write, you must stay two steps ahead. You yeah. have to show up early. You have to stay late. Uh, you have yeah. to read more. Your research is deeper and heavier. But it does make you a better woman and a better man. Yeah. May I explain that state of alert? Let me just tell you where that comes from. Uh, so when we're talking about the state of alert, uh, when, when we talk about trauma, not everyone who experiences a traumatic event is traumatized. We have to say that. Not everyone, but there are traumatic um, uh, events in, in the world. So when you have a train wreck, you know, institutional racism, all of these things might be traumatic events, but no, we're not all traumatized. So trauma happens when you're, you don't have the resources to cope with the incoming experiences or incoming stimuli that is coming at you. So that's when trauma happens. And then you're, some things are happening in the brain. We're having, you know, the amygdala is saying, I need help, you know, and then we have cortisol that's been released, you know, um, in, in the body. And it's, that's what is supposed to be adaptive. So what's supposed to happen is, when your brain says that you need help, you know, adrenaline is pumping, we get the cortisol pumping if we still need help, but it's supposed to break, it's supposed to pause, okay? You know, the parasympathetic nerve is supposed to say, okay, we are done, we are done with this. But when you are constantly being impacted, you're constantly being impacted by all kinds of issues, and you know, somebody described this system as a, a, a loop, a loop system that has no, it, there's no loophole. So you can't get out. If one doesn't get you, another will get you. So mm. you're in a yeah. constant state. So cortisol is pumping through your body, and that's telling your body that we need help, where it says danger. So when you keep saying you're there's danger, when you keep saying that I need help, the body never rests. There is no rest. And so everything is out of order. Respiratory systems, metabolic systems, all kinds of systems in the body are, 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 are on alert because they feel like, you know, the body is in danger. And so we can't, it impacts our relationships. It impacts the way we see the world. It impacts what you do at, at work. It impacts everything. And, and so being on that state of alert will never fully enjoy the life that we're supposed mm. to enjoy. A full life that is, that is the void of trauma. So we just need to say to people that, look, somehow we have to get to a point where we're not all being traumatized. Wow, I'm so glad that you clarified oh. that. I, you know, that was put beautifully. How does systemic racism affect me as a black woman, LaTanya? Well, for me, um, it affected me in a way that I wasn't expecting first and foremost. Um, you know, we go to school and we do everything and, you know, me and my personality, I am an extrovert. And so, you know, being an extrovert, you know, I pretty much get along with everyone until you kind of face those persons that you come in contact with and they say certain things. Um, for instance, um, okay, oh, you talk too loud. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I remember I had a professor that told me we had to do a presentation and he said to me, oh, you talk too loud. And I found myself at one point toning myself down, but recognizing the fact later I'm called to be that way. This is how I am and this is what I'm supposed to do. And so I began to realize to me, that was a form of racism mm -hmm. because, you know, we are a little bit more jubilant and we, we speak 
our tones are a little bit different. And so when I began to realize that, and I said, oh my goodness, here I am. And I had to deal with this. And so even with the darkness of my skin and my hair being natural. Um, and so, you know, you get those looks and um, you begin to recognize that people are really, really, um, they don't necessarily see you for who you are on the inside. They automatically look at your outer appearance. And so it, it played a part for me. It played, played a little bit of a um, kind of a, a negative connotation, but then I, I, I'm like, you know what? I am who I am. Black is beautiful. Yeah, My yeah. hair is natural and it's beautiful. Yes, and it is. I'm just going to be who I am going to be because I'm different. Yeah. I, I love that. I'm so glad you, you you brought that to our attention. I live here in Hawaii. You ladies is in yeah. Southern California. I hear it all the time that I speak too loud and <laughs> tone it down. I can't tone me down. I am who I am. So I love that. I love that aspect. So what aspects of our history are we looking at at this present time? What aspect of our history are we looking at, Dr. King? Yeah, you know, I was, I'm was. i just smiling because you said the tone it down. And um, it, it actually, you know, at some point, it could also be a trauma response the way we talk. Oh. Uh, <laughs> Not being heard. Mm. Yeah, it could, it could, it's an adapt. We see, look, when we are in a state of, when we, when there's collective trauma, we, mm. we learn to adapt. We learn yeah. to adapt. And when you're not, when you've not been heard, okay, when you've struck, when you've had to, you know, pave the way for everything and fight, sometimes you just need to be emphatic. <laughs> you know, you need to let them hear you. And it's a, remember what I talked about the, um, the DNA expression. Yeah. So this is not about us. It's about grandparents and great grandparents who have had to, you know, maybe have a little bit more volume in order to assert themselves. Okay. And then that's inherited by the next generation that is inherited until we all just acquire it as our own. Not that it's inherit, it's that. I'm just explaining that that could literally be also be a, a, a response, a trauma re response. Right. Now, um, there's a lot of things that we do. What part of our history are we looking at right now? It's the same history that's coming to bite us in the, I mean, like everything that's happening right now are things that have happened in the past. We're looking at um, a history of, you know, um, slavery. We're looking at a history of um, just um, inhumane, you know, mm -hmm. um, behaviors we're looking at a a, a a system that says that an a closed system that says that you don't belong and a, a system that says that yeah. this is not this this that you don't belong here and so all of the things that you guys are talking about are microaggressions when mm. somebody says oh you look you, you look nice for a, a black lady or oh you're you're not as dark as the rest of them or you speak well for a black woman or oh you should go to uh, or you're tall, you should be playing basketball. These are things that are part of the microaggressions that we hear every day. And those little, little things also add to the trauma. So in this point in history, like you, you've asked, for me, I say we need to figure out what, what we need to do. That's not just as um, a collective system, but as individual groups, but also to return to the place of healing and to return to the place of blessing, a place where we were, we, 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 we belong, the place where we, we had our own, our own culture and our own sense of self and nobody, nobody told you that you were not enough, a place of enough. Because what happens is this culture has actually built in a sense of scarcity as if there's not enough for everyone. Because see, it's because of that sense of scarcity that people are so prejudiced or there's racist systems because you feel like if I give you what you, what you deserve, then I won't have enough for myself. But that's a lie. That is, that is evil. That's a lie because there is enough for everybody. There is enough resources in the world for everyone. And there is enough love for everybody. So if we just get to the point of, of enough, 
a point of that enough, a point, a point where we say we belong, we have enough, and uh, we don't need to believe the lie of the, op of the oppression that says that we're not enough or there's not enough for us. There is access for us. I think if we go back to that place, then we begin to build our families. I was saying this on um, Latoya's show the other day. You know, we'll, be, we'll begin to rebuild our families. We'll begin to rebuild our own systems so that we can demonstrate that we're a people and not just property and not just you know three quarters of, of human beings but no matter what the no matter what anybody says if it's say they say you're a full human being if you don't treat me as such that means you don't see me as a full mm. human being so we have to stop proving to people who we are i just want us to be i just want us to be who we're supposed to be the ocean doesn't struggle to be an ocean you know a plant doesn't struggle to be a plant they just plant themselves where they belong and they bloom. So I want us to find a place of belonging and we start to bloom as a people. I love that. I, I really love that. I know also, uh, Dr. King, you're an author as well, but we'll, we'll chat about that a little later. But Latanya, I was reading something today. Um, the National Geographic interviewed uh, co-founder Alicia Garza of um, Black Lives Matters. And they asked her this question, and I want to ask you this question. In this insane moment, in the midst of protests, pandemic, and the faltering economy, what, if anything, is giving you hope? You know what? What's giving me hope is the fact that I'm beginning to see us as a people um, come together. Um, what really, really, um, caught my attention is that, and then seeing people around the world coming together too. Another thing that gives me hope is I'm now seeing our um, allies, as they're calling it, our allies are standing up as well and asking, what is it that we can do? Um, you know, for me, I don't want to hear I'm sorry anymore. There, that's, no. There's no need for I'm sorry. My thing is, um, you know, saying, what can I do? And then holding them accountable for if you ask me what you can do allow me to step in and say this is what i can do and let me do what i do and so that's the part that's giving me hope now and so i'm going to hold on to it and i told uh, friends of mine i say when you see the open door and you see the open window step into it step into the window step into the door because we don't know how long it will last but this is our moment and this is our time and it's our opportunity and so when it's time to move it's time for us to move and as they say the young people say you don't have to get ready when you're already ready and that's that's that that's what gives me hope all right stay woke be bold and courageous so that's it yeah so dr keem how does one learn to believe in themselves i believe that how do you learn to believe in yourself you need to know who you are mm -hmm. you need to hear the right things being said to you uh, faith comes by hearing that's how you develop faith faith is not necessarily a religious concept it is a concept of hope and how do you believe how, how do you how do you how do you believe in yourself when no one has ever told you who you are yeah. so you have to find you have to find who you are you have to you have to find a source of connection you have to see a reflection of who you are so if all around you is chaos and and and, and i'm just going to you know share this with everyone if all around you is chaos if all around you is dysfunction it's going to be very difficult to know who you are because all your all the reflections that you get is, is chaotic, is dysfunctional. You need to find something else to look at. The amygdala, you know, it's always getting, it wants to get all the negative passion, all the negative intense, intense emotions of your life. So when he sees the negativity, the amygdala is going to want to keep re-experiencing that. You know, so it, I when I was when I'll do groups with um uh with uh divorced women a, a, a while ago and um one woman kept she i think she was married like three or four times and she said she said i keep marrying the same person they're just in different different the, 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 the different names different right. everything yeah. i said well because 
what has happened is your amygdala has seen, as you've shown the amygdala what love looks like. Mm. When the, your first experience was, was, was just horrible, the amygdala thought, that's it. That's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to want to keep re-experiencing that. So you're getting attracted to the same people in, the, in different spaces. So it is important. The good news is the amygdala doesn't know the difference between a lived experience or an imagined experience. And so once what we need to do is then find a way to introduce new ways of seeing in, in, in our lives. You need to find that what you want and begin to see that. It needs to be in your forefront. If it's, if, if it's watching movies that, that will lift you up, if it's talking to people, if it's, if it's reading a book, mm -hmm. whatever you need to do. Sometimes it even means relocating if you have to. Mm -hmm. But whatever yeah. you need to do, hope, hope is, is within you, but it's also cultivated around you. So we have to surround ourselves with hopeful people. We have to surround ourselves with people who can say, this is who we are. This is who we want to be. And then faith rises. And then we can move. You oh, can't tell yeah. me to move if I'm not, if I don't know where to go. Does that make sense? It makes a lot of sense. Thank you. And, and, and Latanya, you're an associate professor. And what type of special attention must be given to our younger generation? Um, now that's a good question because now we're in the process of figuring it out mm -hmm. um, because now they're realizing that they did not put enough attention on um, our, our, especially our black students. And so for us, you know, we're going through the distance education now because we're not going back into the classroom. And I begin to realize then, and, and you know, I'm big on culture. And first and foremost, I tell them that you have to listen to them because each culture has its own identity. You have your millennials, you have generation X, you have generation X, Y. They all come from a different culture. And it's up to us as adults to understand where they are. And a lot of times it just cause for us to listen and to really, truly, truly care about what they're dealing with because they're dealing with a lot. As it says, they're smarter, you know, but they're not necessarily wiser. And so that's what we're dealing with now. And so for us, it's a matter of understanding the culture that you're dealing with and then listening and then allowing them to play a part in whatever we're bringing to the table, especially as um, professors in the college. Um, let them understand that they have a piece of the pie as well. And so that's what we're dealing with now, but it, it boils down to um, understanding who they are, what culture they're a part of, and just allowing them to understand that we care and we want the best for you. Oh, I love that, I love that. And, and Dr. King, King, we are in a state of emergency. What needs to happen in America to end systemic racism? Wow. Wow. Thank you for that question. <laughs> it's loaded. Are you, it is, so, uh, and I want you to uh, jump in on that too, Latanya. <laughs> well, I'll just go, yeah, look, the, the reason we have, we can end this. And the reason, the way we can end this is we, it's in threefold. It has to be um, in the, in the, Personally, individually, you have to decide, you know, I'm going to be healed. I want, I don't, I no longer want to be traumatized. As a, collectively, as a Black people, we have to also heal as, as Black people. But within the system that oppresses, the system itself that oppresses, we need to then begin to say, create rooms for, room for Black folks. You know, you need to say, you know, all of these churches who don't have, the, you know, maybe white congregations and don't have, you know, any minority in executive boards, they need to go, they need to be there. We know when we have organizations where, where you know, a, a high percentage are minority black people there, but there's nobody in the boardroom. And it's not because they're, they're not qualified. All of this stuff about they're not qualified. They are qualified black people. They're just yeah. not, they're just not there. And so we need to make room for them. I, you know, when we, when we did away with, um, uh, what is that? When they hired the, you know, you, there was a quota. You guys know what I'm talking about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you know about the quota, I'm sure. Yeah, when, when, they, when they had that, 
it, you know, people said, oh, no, you know, we shouldn't do that as reverse racism. And uh, no, we're trying to bridge a gap. We're trying to bridge a gap of inequity. And it is, it, it is important that right now we begin to bridge gaps of inequity in every, in every structure, in the, in the, in the legal structure, in the, uh, in the political structures, in every, everywhere. We need to begin to do that, and I think we cannot do it alone as Black people. We have, we need, we need everybody here. We need everybody. We need to join hands and say, "This is what needs to be done." We are ready. We want to be at the table of the, the decision making boards. We need to be there. Absolutely, <laughs> that is a loaded question. But let me just take it one step further, since we only have a couple of minutes left, ladies. One message. Where do you see the future, Latanya? Where do you see the future with blacks and and, and you had a conversation on your show about uh, because I can't, Doctor King, you're from Nigeria, mm -hmm. and so we all as black people and brown people need to get together. So where do you see the future? Okay, where do I literally see the future? I, honestly, I think there's a window and a time and a season for everything. Um, right now, I think it's our time. Um, that means, especially us as Black people, it is our time to step up because I believe that the window is there. Um, we're still, even though we have allies and people are saying we're with you and how can I help you, you still got a lot more in high positions that um, could care less. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, right, I think for me, it's a season. It's seasonal. Um, I do believe the Bible. Um, I do believe the Bible is fulfilling itself. And so, um, so like I said, to me, it's seasonal, but I believe right now it's just our time and our opportunity. Um, and we have to just face what we need to face and get through and get everything that we need. Okay, I love that. And you ladies, as I knew it would happen, we need a part two. <laughs> and I am just so excited about that. I wanted to thank you, Dr. King, so much for your time. And I want to thank you, Latanya Washington, for your time. And let's do it again. Uh, we're going to come back on Thursday, July uh, 23rd, and we will do a part two on the impact of systemic racism and mental health in the Black culture. And I want to advise everyone, please wear your mask. Wear your mask every day. Please wear your mask. And everyone, thank you for spending your time with Sisters Empowering Hawaii. Oceans of aloha, peace, and love. Aloha. Thank you. Oh.